extracted out of some of the data that we received from Medicaid. When Optum was trying to put together an RFP, or a, a response to the proposal, what we learned were these data as a reflection of, and I, if I'm not mistaken, that's two years worth of distilled information. Here is where Idaho put their resources. The allocation of resources in Idaho, as you can see, the lion's share, go to CBRS. And the lion's share of the lion's share go to children. This is before Optum Idaho. And we haven't been doing this long enough to have a slide after Optum Idaho. But as you can see there, in the context of individual therapy, versus CBRS, it's a clear distortion of what was thought to be occurring. I mean, when you talk to most people, you think, well, are you in some behavioral health treatment or mental health treatment? The assumption is that you're doing therapy. From a clinical standpoint, this is an indication that there was a lot of CBRS being funded but not an awful lot of therapy. Now there are folks who would, who would say to me, and they have, well gee, Dennis, we think CBRS is therapy. And I would tend to agree with you in certain circumstances. There are some very talented CBRS technicians. And I mean that. They know what they're doing. They have a way with them about children or about other adults that seems to work. But in terms of resource allocation, this appeared to the legislature to be something that was wildly out of control. There is no other state in the country that has this profile. We're alone. And that's what I, when I started this conversation, I said Idaho was unique. We are truly unique in this sense. There are other states that use PSR or CBRS but not in this proportion, not this distribution of resources. And we're going to talk a little bit about CBRS or PSR. Now here's a case example. And maybe I'll hold on that for just a second. CBRS, as some of you may know, some of you might not, was designed originally and has been empirically demonstrated as an evidence-based practice for one population. That's adult chronic schizophrenics. That's it. Now there are encouraging trends in data to suggest that, well, it might be good for folks, adults, who have a bipolar disorder or major depression. And there's some preliminary findings suggesting that well, it may have some good outcomes for kids who have autism, or I should say people who have autism. Otherwise, when it comes to an evidence-based practice, there's little out there yet, and it's, I'm sure, based on the three studies or four studies I received, that folks are trying to demonstrate what this effectiveness is. But this is where it came from. Chronic schizophrenics and CBRS really works. It helps stabilize their lives, it helps get them into employment, and it keeps them out of the hospital. <clears throat> when Optum came and began to work in Idaho, it was very apparent to us, based on that slide I showed you, that it would be absurd to come in and basically rip the, the bandage off the scab. There are too many people who live in Beauville, Idaho, or Rome, Idaho, or small towns in Idaho who actually have some benefit. Now, is it a therapeutic benefit? That could be debatable. But at least a benefit of some sort that seems to be provided by CBRS. So the issue for us at Optum and you as providers is to try and figure out, OK, how do we do this in a way that makes sense from a therapeutic perspective, but also from a reality perspective. 
And I, and I have heard folks say, well, CBRS keeps people out of jail. Well, folks, that might be the case, but that's not what the benefit is being designated for through the legislature and then the policy. It is not a jail prevention procedure. There's no evidence-based practice to support that. So we're kind of stuck with this issue of accountability for what we're doing, describing what we're doing, and then agreeing what makes the most sense, which is the whole reason we try to invite that collaboration. <clears throat> when you have folks who are non-responders uh, in terms of treatment, difficult to kind of get motivated, CBRS intervention sometimes can complement those efforts as you're trying to get them into the clinic. The other argument would be, if you can't get them into the clinic, why don't you go to them? Provide the service, the cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, that you want to for them in their, in their area. Here's just a kind of a review of what I just mentioned to you. <laughs> it was originally designed to help people with their living skills as adults, providing social skills training. Illness management, in other words, resiliency, trying to recover, and supporting employment. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why the downward extension into children's services happens so naturally. Because almost every referral I see for a review has this written into it. Social skills training. The problem is, when I ask in the peer review, what are you, what are you using for your social skills training? It's an amorphous, undefined protocol of activities that really don't have an insight. And that's a, that's a difficulty because there's really no measurable issue here. And that's typically where, we, where the provider stumbles. I already asked you in the context of group, uh, CBRS, how many of you do it? And it doesn't look like much more than one of you. The CBRS, I think the other phenomenon that was very interesting in Idaho is that as a person entered into CBRS, when you look at the trend analysis for those people who left CBRS, it was difficult to find. So folks seem to be coming into service with CBRS, but not leaving. And that was a hard one to justify, to look at, well, if it's working, why why aren't people actually exiting the service? Okay, so the next steps, the best use of the benefit throughout. <coughs> know the diagnoses. Oh, and I had someone also say to me, are you trying to tell me that you don't, <coughs> that you don't think a master's level social worker can get a diagnosis right? And no, I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that if that, there's a question about that diagnosis, use an alternative, a second opinion, to try and see if you can't nail down what the diagnosis should be. The second step is knowing the evidence-based practices. And you can start right there on that uh, Optum website. And for those of you who are interested in terms of CBRS and its effectiveness, I would really encourage you to take a, take a look at some of the textbooks that were written about what CBRS is. And there are some current ones as of about 2009. Corrigan is probably the best example. I've already mentioned the counting and tracking measurable primary outcomes. Getting those concrete measurable things in place that you can look at six months to a year to 18 months down the road. And when you see it as appropriate, Get that service extended to our members at an intensity level that you think is appropriate for the concerns you have. And that means not only frequency, but diversity. If you think family therapy is relevant to a child who has an oppositional defiant disorder, you're probably right. 
So the first thing you hear in the peer reviews is, how come the family isn't in therapy? Why aren't the parents doing behavior training? Because most of the agencies actually offer those. And that's a billable service. I'll hear the vignettes. So as I said, I'll, uh, well, maybe we'll do one. I don't want to stand here and read it to you, but can you folks in the back actually read that? I know it's, it's there's a lot of it. So the synopsis of this is the member had a primary obstacle to getting into the office. And the, the provider, actually, who was giving or doing CBRS, wasn't aware of the fact that at the master's level and licensed, she really wasn't doing CBRS when she went to the person's house. She's actually doing on-site cognitive behavioral interventions. In a case like this, a treatment indicator and a, an improvement indicator is getting the patient into your office. And under these circumstances, this is a perfect example of where CBRS is probably very appropriate. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk closer to your mic? We can barely hear you. Am I getting away from it again? Yes, I'm sorry. Just wear it. Nah. <laughs> okay, I feel more like Bob Barker this way. So. Yeah, but we will hear you that way. All right, I'll, I'll try to be better at it. Thank you. So anyway, uh, the, the point that was made, and this is partially based on uh, actual situation, the point that's being made here is that look at the circumstances you're working with. Look at the diversity of interventions that are possible. And if, I mean, if does, do any of you as owners put people with a master's level in CBRS roles? Yes. Uh, not a single hand. One? No, oh, okay. You guys are just feeling shy. All right. Perhaps a second. This system transformation in general, what we would like to see happen over time, and this isn't going to happen by May 5th or you know, even November 5th, but over time, what we'd like to see is a culture evolving and developing that puts the member-centered care system based on recovery and resilience. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to be cured by any stretch of the imagination. But anybody who's in therapy should be able to improve. That improvement increases their resiliency. We really like the use of licensed clinicians. If you can't tell by now, we want you using licensed clinicians as effectively as you possibly can with the appropriate intensity level based on the patient or the member's needs. Now, way down the road, envisioned, <clears throat> is the ability for one of our members to walk into your shop and have a variety of concerns, but not necessarily need to leave your shop. And what that means is the goal, in a sense, is kind of what Idaho Health and Welfare work toward, that one door policy. If you have a concern, and most of the folks that we're working with in our population are very complicated, and they typically have more than one concern, we want for, oops, we want for these issues, these issues to be addressable as conveniently as possible for our members. Now, I had a, a gentleman who owns a, a practice over in Region 3 ask me, well, what does this mean for the, uh, for the little guy? What's this mean? Well, the truth is, if all you do out of your agency is CBRS and nothing more, it means you probably need to look at a different business model. Because diversity and flexibility 
translates to efficiency. And if you've got a one role activity, it's going to be harder for you to demonstrate that sort of flexibility. And so talking to other agencies that perhaps do case management, that do therapy, and then complementing them with your CBRS may be something to think about. There will always be a place, at least from the standpoint of service provision, for clinical groups who do therapy. If you offer family therapy and individual therapy and trauma-based cognitive behavioral therapy, PTSD therapy, and you're using evidence-based practices, I think you can rest assured that you will be busy. These issues are relevant in the new millennium. In the 2014 that we live in, folks who are receiving these services are looking for convenience. They're looking for effectiveness. And that's what we'd like to help them get to. And in a sense, this sort of thing tends to be more efficient. But we all know, just because you're big doesn't mean you're great. Are there smaller shops out there who could deliver an excellent or high quality psychotherapeutic mm -hmm. intervention? And the answer is yes. It all kind of depends on what it is you want to do and you're interested in doing. But all of these are on the docket for service provision. This transportation or transformation is going to take some time. How much time, I don't know. We work within a system that's fairly small, communicative, and reactive. And so I think um, the legislature was very concerned based upon feedback they were getting. They let us know that. We were down there at the legislature trying to communicate with them, and actually with providers. There will be a need for flexibility, not just on your part, but on ours. And within the confines of the, of the agreed upon RFP, the contractual relationship with Idaho Medicaid, we're going to try and be flexible, particularly when it benefits our members. And uh, this is something whoop, this is something that uh, Jeff Berlant put in. There's always going to be a need for CBRS. The issue of change creates anxiety. You folks work with mental health circumstances all the time. You know that the proposition of treatment means change. Change means anxiousness. Anxiety and fear aren't a good combination when it comes to making important decisions without communication. So that's, you know, if there were one thing that I would hope that you would leave with today is the notion that that communication between yourselves and Optum, yourselves and the legislature, yourselves and Idaho Health and Welfare, because we all talk, is really important. We'd like to use a broader spectrum of services for our members. We want you to use what is known to work. We want to join with you. <coughs> Even though the, the initial dance was difficult because we weren't all together with our technology, and we take a hit for that. And that was a real mistake. Hopefully we've addressed it and it's working. But we think that with some of these primal concepts, we're going to end up getting a package delivered through your talents to the members that we have here in Idaho. And we do think together that we can do it better. End of slideshow. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is, if you haven't already, uh, write your questions, and Aaron in the back will take them. And we've got refreshments. And is there anything back on that back table? There's some back there. Okay. And we'll take a bio break for, let's say, 12 minutes. All right? So I'll see you back here on my watch at about 5 after.